Welcome, everyone. Uh, my guest today is Nathan Manteith. He's a CCO at Podbeat and ECD at High Dive Advertising. Uh, happy to have you here today. Uh, do you want to give a uh, proper introduction about yourself? Sure. Thanks for having me, Danny. Appreciate it. Um, yeah, like you said, uh, I've I've got a, a company that I started on the side called Podbeat. It's a mobile app, but you know, during the day, I'm the ECD at High Dive Advertising, which is an agency in Chicago. And you know, we've got a great selection of clients. We probably make the best Super Bowl commercials uh, every year. We've won three out of the last four years. Uh, the Ad Age Meter, the USA Today Meter. So we've done that for Jeep. We've done that for Rocket Mortgage. And this year, I think we're going to do it for two other clients in BetMGM and State Farm. So, Yeah, yeah, that, that's crazy, man. Um, so you had five Super Bowl commercials uh, in total? Yeah, over the last, last few years, I did um, one for Jeep with uh, Jeff Goldblum, which was, you know, a con connection to obviously Jurassic Park. So we had him use, that was done like in 2018. Uh, we then also did one for Ram called Thank God I'm a Country Boy, which was, you know, kind of like this idea that if you love this country, you're a country boy. And it was about bringing everybody together saying, hey, it's not just this one thing. It was about celebrating truck drivers uh, across the nation. Uh, last year we had two in. We had, um, it was Jeep's electric boogie introducing the uh, the hybrid electric Wrangler. So of course we had, uh, we worked with Shaggy. Um, you know, it wasn't me of, it wasn't me and uh, Mr. Boombastic. I don't know, do you know Shaggy, Danny? Uh, I'm not, but uh, yeah, maybe maybe other people also don't, so please don't. Oh yeah, you would know his stuff. Um, so he re redid the electric boogie for us and that was part of the big game. And then we also did a, a spot for Ram again last year for uh, their new EV vehicle, the Revolution. And it was all about premature electrification, about how the, you know, the industry of electric vehicles just kind of went a little too fast. And, uh, you know, you know how it goes. That one was great. <laughs> um, uh, can I uh, like put the links to, the, um, to those commercials in the description if, if it's okay? Yeah, like for, for sure, the... for sure. Yeah, yeah and then that's I... right. Just thinking back, the first one I actually did was in 2016 for Jeep, which was called Four by Forever. Um, and I wrote a song called Four by Forever that they loved enough to kind of like put it in the big game. So we hired a Sony music artist, uh, Morgan Dore, to actually record the song. And that aired in 2016. And it got, it got about 40,000 downloads during the commercial. So it kind of really helped us kind of win that account at the time. Yeah, man, that's that sounds super cool. Um, I know that you probably cannot share everything, but if you can, um, how much revenue do those commercials can produce at the Super Bowl? That's really tough. It's hard to figure it out, really, because it's not like you see a commercial and then you go and you get in your vehicle and you drive to a dealership and buy a car. It doesn't work like that, right? The Super Bowl is the perfect way to kind of plant a feeling in people about a brand, you know, like make them smile, give them a, a, a sense about what you kind of, obviously what the vehicle does, but just what you stand for. So it, I think it's, it's almost impossible to really track what kind of money that brings back. You know, I think about the spot we did for Jeep with Bill Murray for Groundhog Day. That was about four years ago. And, you know, that spot, the Gladiator sales after that just, just took right off. Now, it was a new vehicle at the time. So, of course, you can look at the commercial and say, okay, well, that, that launched awareness that Jeep was making a truck, right? That helped a ton. And then for the whole rest of the year, sales took off. But, of course, during the year, we're doing more stuff to supplement that ad, right? So it's not like just that ad's done and then we just lay back. So we got to keep going. So I think it's very, very tough for advertisers to really mark the ROI for exactly specific commercials. Yeah, totally makes sense. So it's more of a long-term game. It's about aver awareness, not just like once you saw that and you bought the car or whatever. Exactly. It's brand building, right? You're building, yeah. you're building a feeling people have about your brand um, in their heart. And then eventually one day 
they need a car or they're walking down the aisle and they see that thing on a shelf and they go, I like that. I don't know why I like that, but I like that for some reason. And that helps. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, do you want to share how how that process goes? Because like I'm I'm not an advertiser. I I have a tech background. I'm building my startup, but uh, I have no idea how that works. And I'm very curious to learn. Um, how do you find clients? How do you work with them? How do you produce the actual commercial? Uh, what's happening after that? Can you walk us through through that? Sure. I'll I'll stay away from the how we find clients thing because we have people that kind of do that. And I also think the most interesting process is the creative one, right? So let's take Super Bowl, for example. We'll start thinking about what to do for our clients for Super Bowl about six months before the game, before football even starts. <laughs> so we'll sit down and that's when it kind of, we kick off. We know what we want to advertise. We sort of know what we have to have to say. Um, then what I'll have is a creative brief is put together. They'll bring in maybe about 10 to 15 creative teams. They all kind of go off. I brief them with my account team and with our planners and strategists. Then they go off and maybe a week later, they come back and they show us their first kind of thoughts. And this is really rough. Like this is like someone just going, hey, so it's, you know, it's uh, we're going to take Groundhog Day. Um, we're going to Bill Murray and uh, he's going to be, he's going to see the Jeep and it's a truck and it's different. You know, Groundhog Day was all about everything being the same. Jeep's never made a truck before. So all of a sudden it's different. And I'll be like, okay, that's interesting. So we'll write that down. We'll say, okay, that's interesting. Let's put that over there. Every team will have about 10 to 15 different ideas. So I'll sift through um, probably two, 300 ideas. And then we'll start to kind of go, okay, what kind of sticks here? Send the teams back, tell them to keep going. You know, because this is a process that goes for months and months. Eventually, we narrow it down to maybe about 10 ideas. Then we take those ideas to the client. And that's, we call that like round one, right? And we try to keep it fairly loose. Like, you want to involve a client and get their opinion on something at such a, at an early enough stage where they can actually affect it and help. You know, we're not, we're not big on the whole, ta-da, here it is moment. We want to involve the clients, especially when you're working with them for like five months on something. Get them in early, get them to see like the seed of an idea so they can kind of like work on it with you. And that helps them have ownership of it, right? Because the moment they start to feel like, oh, I'm involved in this. I've got, I've got skin in this game now. I, I said that one thing during the meeting when they were presenting that they, when they came back, they put it in the spot. That's kind of cool. They really heard me there. So now, now all of a sudden the client's like, I mean, this is my thing now. All of a sudden, you're not across the table anymore. You're both on the same side. And then you have to take this idea through their levels further up, which is, you know, three, four different levels. And you're helping them kind of present it and sell that through. So it's, it's a long process, but it's a good one in testing if something's good enough that it can last. You know, you think of a, think of any, like a great song. It's got to work on just the singer playing with their acoustic guitar. If a, just a singer with their acoustic guitar sits down or at a piano, plays a song and it sounds amazing, you know that once you go to produce that and make that and add all the extra elements, it's just going to get better. But at the level of where it is at the, on the page, it's got to be pretty good. Yeah, that's awesome. And what's your favorite part of all this creative process? What do you enjoy the most? Probably working with the teams because when they bring you these ideas, they're never formed, right? They're never perfect. They're, they're little like thoughts that the teams have. And then you kind of sit down with them. You go, okay, I don't like what you've done here, but that really, that thing over here that you said, that's really interesting. Let's kind of talk about that for a bit. It's almost like a, it's like creative therapy. In a way, we'll sit there and go, okay, let's talk about this for a bit. Tell me more about it. You know, we'll, we'll push it back and forth. So I think that part, the, the curating and the spotting of like little, little nuggets, we call them in ideas. That's fun. Like I, when I go into those meetings, I'm sitting there going, all right, I'm going to see a whole bunch of stuff. I'm going to see a whole bunch of terrible ideas, but there's value sometimes in them, in the little, little corners of those ideas, if you will. Yeah, yeah, that sounds that sounds great, man. Um, 
so from what I understand, you guys are preparing a, a commercial for this Super Bowl. Can you share anything about that? Yes. This year was heartbreaking, man. We do not have one in this year's game. So now High Dive as an agency, we've got two uh, for, for State Farm and for Bet MGM. But Jeep and Ram do not. So that, you know, heavy heart, man. It was a tough year for, for Stellantis is the, the top level company that owns all the different brands. You know, with the auto, auto worker strike that happened, that, you know, that really affected uh, production, that really affected budgets. And, and rightfully so, you know, um, coming out of something difficult like an auto worker strike, where you've been talking about money and talking about like what people should be paid, it just didn't feel right for them to kind of then go and spend 10 million bucks on a Super Bowl spot, you know, that did it. So I actually really like, I admire that they said, they sat back and said, you know what, let's listen to the people. We just went through negotiations on salaries and things that are important to people. Let's not do a big, funny commercial on the Super Bowl. Let's respect that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I totally get it. And yeah, for you guys, it's totally heartbreaking, but on the other hand, that makes sense and probably it's fair, right? Yeah. But the great thing is, though, Danny, we went through the process of doing all the work, though. So there's never any creative work wasted, I always feel. And any act of being creative and thinking of ideas and stuff, that's going to come back at some stage, at some point. You know, we've, we've had a lot of ideas that were presented like two years ago, three years ago, and then all of a sudden their time is right. So I've got a lot of ideas now from teams that we could have done this year. They'll have another another day if you will. It just yeah. won't be this Super Bowl Sunday. Yeah. So it's interesting. Do, do you think you can re like reuse parts of what you already done for that, like preparation work uh, for like next uh, commercials? Or is it just on the idea level? You can reuse it. Yes. Uh, a lot of times, not not all the time. But if the idea is just a great story, you know, a great story being told that has a great human insight, there's no expiration date on that, you know? So if the next year they're coming out with a different vehicle, often we'll find sometimes an insight or an idea we had like a year or two ago, it's actually just better for this year and for this specific product. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. And I'm also wondering, like in general, um, you start the process well, uh, in the like previous Super Bowls, you started the process like six months earlier, but you cannot predict the futures. So say, let's say, I don't know, COVID hits or some kind of a major event that disrupts everything. Uh, do you have to adjust your final uh, commercial to that? Or do you just, are you just sticking to, to what you've done uh, during those six months? How, how does that work? You do. It's, it's a great question. Because the best, some of the best Super Bowl commercials like touch on a cultural moment, right? So how can you six months in advance know what that moment's going to be? You know, I'm sure, I'm sure we're going to see a bunch of AI ideas. You know, <laughs> that's just going to happen during the game. You know, and that's touching on something that's cultural. So yeah, you do have to adjust it, and you want to be able to, um, like again, going back to the Bill Murray idea, we we knew it was going to be on Groundhog Day, right? We knew it was February 2nd, the game is on Groundhog Day. So not all the ideas focused on that, but that allowed you to, in advance, be able to set yourself up for something that you knew people were going to talk about and it was relevant. Um, but yeah, there are a lot of ideas that you do look at and go, you know, this one's gone. This, the timing on this is over. Um, you know, not to, it, maybe it comes back, you know, years and years down the road, but it's just, it's not as good now. You know, I think, there's a temptation for creative people to try to like, I've got this great idea and just all of a sudden it, it misses its window, but then you try to find another window for it. And it's just not the same. It's a, it's a tiny window. It's not the right window. So I think that's a, that discipline is very tough as a creative person to say, you know what, I got to hold this one back. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense, man. Uh, you also mentioned, like privately to me, that uh, you have some stories uh, working with uh, Jimmy Fallon, uh, Alec Baldwin. Uh, do you want to share any of that? Yeah, I mean, hey, when I moved from Toronto, I'm originally from Toronto. 
when I moved from Toronto to Chicago, I, it was to run the Capital One account. And at the time, it was, I, was, I was so excited about that because Capital One understands the value of entertaining. I mean, they especially did then. They understood, listen, if I'm going to talk to you about, your, about banking, I'm going to do it so that you enjoy the whole time I'm telling you about it. So, you know, at the time, um, Alec Baldwin was brought in to be the spokesperson. And he's just a consummate professional. You know, it's kind of heartbreaking to see what he's going through right now because he is so, he cares so much about the craft of movie making, about the craft of acting. There was a day when we were on set. Uh, so I did about five or six commercials with him. He would come in on set and walk around. Now on set, there are about 50, 60 people sometimes, sometimes a hundred. He would walk around and shake hands with every one of them, get to know them and get their name and introduce himself. And his approach, his approach was always, I'm going to be working with these people all day. I want to get to know them. We are all here together working as a team. I think that's easy to say, but having worked with a lot of celebrities, not, not all of them do that, you know? Um, so he's just such a consummate professional. He would come in. What was so important to him was that everyone approached the day like they were making the most important thing ever. He would come in and call everybody in and do a speech and he would talk about, listen, we're doing commercial, but that's not what this is about. We're all here operating at the highest level of our craft. Let's do that together. Let's all make sure we're focused and we're doing that together. It was pretty good. And, you know, I'm sure you've heard stories of him like getting upset on set, but it's only because he gets so let down if he finds someone not taking the job seriously, not taking the craft of what they're doing seriously. So I just appreciate that. There was a, a time he, he called me into his trailer and we we're doing this commercial where he's sitting up on this, this stack of luggage. Um, it was like a throne of luggage was the idea. He would sit on it and it would go through the airport and he was talking about the venture card and how you could earn points for traveling. And Alec didn't like the chair. He did not like sitting in it. So by the time we got to the fourth commercial, um, his people say, Alec would like to speak with you in the trailer. It's like, okay. I go into the trailer. Alec, he's not a huge man, but he's just big in like his personality. He's just, he's got this intensity to him when he looks at you. So he's sitting in the makeup chair. I'm standing behind him and he's looking at me through the mirror. And he looks at me and says, Nathan. It's like, yeah, no. I see you in the chair again. And I was like, Yes, you're you're in the chair. You you did get the script in advance though, right? He's like, Oh, I got the script. I see that I'm in the chair. He's like, Yes. I don't like the chair, Nathan. And, it's, and it's he's looking right through me, just just intensity. And what he's looking for is to see if I believe in this idea. To see if I think what we're about to do is the right thing. Do I believe in it? That's what he wants to know from me. And I say to him, Alec, it's working well for the client. I know you don't like it, but people are responding to it. And that's why we're here today. And that's why we're making a few more of these. And he just looks at me and goes, okay. And um, just, it, when you're talking to someone of his level, it's intimidating, right? But again, he's just looking for that belief. He's just looking for your conviction of whether you believe in it. And whether you, he likes it or not, it actually doesn't matter if if he believes that you think it's the right thing. That's that's a super interesting story. One of the one, one of the craziest ones uh, I've heard. And what about Jimmy Fallon? You know, Jimmy Jimmy's a just a loving, caring human. He's it's almost like he's such a kind man. It almost works against him. Like, cause you, as you're talking to him, he will agree to like doing all, every, anything. He will agree to it. And you're like, yeah, okay. Yeah, let's do that. Yeah. And then he'll go off and then, then someone will come over and go, Hey guys, um, Jimmy doesn't want to do that. You know, he'll do the other things, but he doesn't want to do that one. And I'll be like, but, but you know, but he, he just says like, yeah, I know. He just didn't want to say it. He's like, he's like just big, soft as a Canadian. He's got a very Canadian vibe about him. He's just a kind, kind fellow. Um, another fun story actually is Jeff Goldblum. 
he was very uh, interesting too. You know, if, if Alec Baldwin's up here for professionalism, Jeff Goldblum, he's like right there. Remember we were on set working with him on this Jeep Jurassic spot. So the idea was, of course, he has that classic scene where he's in the Jeep from Jurassic Park. So we were bringing that back to life. We were going to kind of like bring it now to the future. Um, he's going to look in the mirror and all of a sudden he's going to be now in the new Wrangler being chased by the dinosaur again. So he came over to us on set because we had to rewrite some lines for him. And we brought him a long sheet of like these other funny lines we wanted to get. And he comes over to us and he goes, Hey guys, um, um, can, can we all, can we all talk for a second? Okay, great, great. Let's all, let's all gather around. And he's, he's huge. He's like six, five. He is just this big man who stands over you, but he's like this, he's very delicate as well. So he said, like, okay, everyone's so huddle, huddle in. Okay. So I've got your lines, um, that you want me to say. And, 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 and here's the thing guys, it's not what the words are. It's, it's how I say them. That's how this is going to work. So, so I, I circled a few of the lines that I'd like to kind of, kind of read. And we look at the long sheet, there's like 40 lines. He circled three. <laughs> so we're like, I'm there. The writers are there. And we're like, uh, okay. And he's like, okay, okay. So yes, I know. But everyone listen, I'm going to say these and this is how it matters. Um, and the line was something like, would you like to do a test drive? And he would just simply look over and go, I just did. And I can't do it justice. But the way he would say certain little tiny phrases as he huddled us in there, we just all like, okay, yep, that's great, perfect. And it was just amazing. And if you look at that commercial, he just he just nails his his position and nails his lines. Such a pro, you know. People that are good at this stuff, you can't, you know, th they're at the level they are because they're so good. There's very few people that can take the smallest little thing and with the tiniest little gesture or slight twist of phrase. Um, just make it magic. So. Yeah, man. Thanks for sharing that. That's, that's su super nice to hear to, to learn because like uh, not many people have worked with people of that level. Right. And uh, that's quite an insight to, to, to learn uh, these small things that you're sharing. That's, that's yeah. I mean, when you, when you think about what you do for your business and, and our business is the level of craft of something is so important, no matter what it is, all the details, especially in tech, when we're designing these products, every little detail is so important, you know, and it's more fun to care about it that way too, right? You, not only do you get way more out of it as far as like it being a better product or being a better commercial or it being a better performance, the act of crafting it, the act of like being all over it, you have to enjoy that. If you enjoy that part, you know, it, it's a win-win because you're enjoying all the, the hardship that goes into making this thing. And then the result is also amazing. It, it's a win-win, right? Definitely. And uh, so that's very interesting. You um, create those commercials for like uh, these great events and work with amazing people. And suddenly you decided to go into tech, into startups. Uh, you have the company called uh, Podbeat. Uh, so can you tell us a little bit more about that? How did you, why did you decide to start it? And what, what's the product all about? Uh, please, please share that. Oh, thank you for the plug. I'm going to give you that. <laughs> Podbeat. Let me get so you can download it now. Uh, so yeah. Podbeat, um, I'm a huge podcast fan. I love podcasts, man. I'm, it's, I'm so happy the way they're blown up like they have over the last five, six years. Um, so congrats on you having one as well. So I do a lot of running. So I'll do, I'll go for like 10 mile runs. I, this morning before we got on here, I did a eight mile run and I listen to podcasts. It's where I catch up on things like This Week in Startups. It's where I listen to Hard Fork. It's where I listen to all the great podcasts that like the online podcast that kind of talk about our business, right? But running to them over the last few years, I realized um, it, it was always missing something. You know, it was always missing like an extra level of motivation. And at the time I was trying to think, what can we do about this? And unfortunately what happened was my wife went some, through something. She actually lost her sight for about six months. And during that time, she also liked to work out and listen to podcasts. 
So she still wanted to work out. So she would get on the treadmill because that's still safe. And she would walk on the treadmill and she would just listening to her true crime podcast. She would say, can you play some beats behind this? Because there was no way to do it. So I would have to have a separate speaker and play beats on a speaker. And while she listened, so she could listen to the podcast and have some energy. And one day she was just like, we, we should make this an app. And I was like, yeah, it's gotta exist, right? Look around. It doesn't, it doesn't exist because there's a, there's a hardware issue with, with how your, your, your mobile phone works, right? It only allows one audio source. We figured out a way around that. So Podbeat, you can download Podbeat. It's free. What it does, it allows you to add a beat to any podcast. And you've got several different beat styles to choose from, you know, so the beats are very minimal, you know, as a former musician, it's very important that we respect the craft of a podcast. It's respect what's being said. So we craft the beats and design the beats to be very minimal so that they, they support the voice. They work in rhythm with the voice Um, because voices have rhythm. It's just, it needs something to kind of like give that structure. Right. I don't think people think about that a lot. When the way we speak has a rhythm to it, you know, none of us speak really fast and talk about something like this. And then all of a sudden start talking a little bit slower and talking like this and start speeding up again. We all kind of have a natural rhythm that, that falls in place. And when you place a beat underneath it, those two rhythms start to work together. So anyone that downloads pod beat and gives it a try, we get great comments from users. They are addicted to it. You can't go back to just someone talking after you've added a beat to it. All right, so we have the Podbeat link in the description. Everyone, please download it and listen to this episode with Podbeat. Uh, I'm going to do that too. Uh, That sounds like a great idea. So uh, can you uh, just guide us through how it works? Do you download it? it? How does it connect to the audio? For sure, it's free in the App Store. So we've got it in Google Play Store as well as the App Store. you pick your podcast, you're listening to your podcast. Once you've downloaded Podbeat, you just open Podbeat up. And while your podcast is playing, you can just simply play any beat and you hear it underneath the talking. Now, you're also able to control the beat speed and the volume. Because again, very important, we do not want to take away from the content of the podcast. So having that volume control allows you to set the, the speed that you like. Right now, we've got about 14 different beat styles in there. That you can choose from we've got like afro beats we got reggaeton coming soon we just dropped some funk beats got pop edm everything and uh it's super enjoyable anybody everyone that uses it really likes it man so thank you for for saying it's free right now we're doing a freemium model for people to use right now all we care about is users we just care about people using it telling us what they think about it um we get lots of comments through threads instagram facebook youtube um, and we're going to be doing some LinkedIn ads soon as well. I mean, these are all fantastic platforms for us to talk about how Podbeat works. We are now also partnering with podcasts like yourself, where we are having them do pre-roll at the beginning of each pod. Now, there's a lot of ads that a lot of platforms that do advertising before a podcast, but ours is very relevant. You know, like, like so, Danny, you can come on your show now and just say, hey, today we're speaking with uh, Nathan Monteith. Uh, CCO of Podbeat and works at High Dive Advertising. And, but hey, before you listen to the podcast, if you're going for a walk or a hike or you're going for a run, download Podbeat. Add a beat. You'll actually hear my voice with a beat behind it. I actually sound pretty good with trap. So give it a try and let us know. So it's a very organic way to kind of work Podbeat into the podcast format. And then the way we help podcasts out on our end is we use their sound bites. We use clips from their podcasts in all our social channels to kind of show how they promote their podcast and then show how their podcast sounds with a beat from Podbeat. I love it. Uh, and I don't know, this, this sounds like a great business model, a great idea. Um, I don't know, like I might be a hundreds person who, who, uh, who might suggest it to you, but have you thought about uh, integrating some kind of AI into the system that would kind of create a perfect bit for a specific podcast automatically? We have been looking at it. We've actually been sourcing a lot of uh, AI driven beats. We use them for, for more for inspiration uh, right now. They're just not at the level of, of, of what our DJs and our beat makers can do. You know, we run our loops for each pod beat um, beat 
in three minute loops. And that's based on actually how people kind of exercise and how the body responds. So the, the beat kind of starts, builds, 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 picks up, grows a little bit, and then it devolves so that when it hits its loop, you, uh, you feel that rhythm and you feel that rhythm when you're running uh, as well. So the AI beats are not at the level of what our humans can do quite yet. I'm sure they'll get there, but right now they just, they're missing some, some of the emotional elements of like how a beat it builds. Um, we are using a lot of AI for our ads on our social posts. So I use, I use Midjourney myself. I do all the advertising right now for it. Uh, my background is design. Um, so we're using AI for all of our promotions and marketing, and we're using it for our beat sources. We've also been using AI for translation. This is going to be the biggest thing that's happened to podcasts. The idea that every podcast is now going to be able to be done in different languages around the world. You know, thankfully, English, that's most people's first or second language. So that's been good so far. Sure, you've got things like This Week in Startups being listened to around the world, you know. But now to listen to the host, Jason Calacanis, in a different language, that's going to open things up. And it opens things up for us as well. Because beats, beats are bilingual. They, they, the beats work against any language. So you can hear that in some of our social posts. Now, when we get a large spike of downloads of Podbeat, say in South America, what I'll do is I'll start translating my social videos into Spanish. So I've got some of my, on our TikTok, TikTok channel right now of me speaking Spanish. It's pretty good. They do a great job of it. I've also got some German ones coming out. And then, uh, so that, so we're using AI for all of our marketing stuff, but we're not, it's not built quite into the app yet. Yeah. Yeah. And I love what you, uh, what you said about translation. I think that Mr. Beast, uh, like the most popular YouTuber, he yep. used that strategy to, to go into the South American, like Brazilian market, even I think Chinese market, I'm not sure, but it, it kind of brought a lot of new. Uh, viewers just by dubbing uh, his videos. And what was a uh, funny thing, uh, I might uh, not remember it correctly, but he asked like a local Brazilian uh, dub guy for Spider-Man movie to yes, he did. have his voice. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Jimmy is very smart, uh, Mr. Beast. He He's ahead of the curve. There's a guy who cares about craft right? He cares about trying to make the best video every time. It's all he's ever cared about. He's so driven on it. Um, yeah, he, he's done a great job. Have you, ever had a, <laughs> uh, have you had a chance to meet him? Uh, no, I have not. Have you? Do, no, no, not yet though. <laughs> but yeah, uh, I mean, uh, I love this, uh, like definitely in the creative uh, industry, this is like the guy who you have to learn from because like, as you said, you're ahead of a, he, he's ahead of the curve, yep. uh, but, but also like in terms of just building businesses and entrepreneurship, this guy, I, I love him. Like I, I watch all, all of his videos and I just love his style, uh, what he does, does in social media and also kind of resonates with me uh, as a more of a Gen Z uh, type of uh, person generation. Yep. And I don't know how he does it, but yeah, it's, it's a very uh, interesting uh, case study. Uh, well, I know how he does it. He's been doing it for how long? Like 12 years? He's been doing it since he was a, like, yeah, right? So I don't think, I mean, if you ever look at some of his very, very early uh, videos, he didn't know how to do it. He figured it out. And that's, he just grew and just learned how to, to create the perfect hook, you know, like, and it is interesting, you're right, to see him now branching out into like the Feastables, you know, to actually start marketing products and being part of the product. And it's funny you say, like, have you met him? I don't know if we need to meet him. I think he's exactly how he comes off in his videos. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I think there's no difference between his social presence and who he is. Yeah, I also think so. Okay, before we end, uh, do you have any final word, uh, like, anything, maybe it's some advice to young people in this industry or in entrepreneurship, maybe it's uh, some lesson that you learned and you want to share or anything else that you want to bring out there. 
You know, I, I would I would speak to work life balance. You know, I think people talk about that a lot. You know, as someone who balances their their day job, you know, running at an ad agency, running these large accounts, but then my night job of my podbeat, you know, that work life balance thing is important. But I think it's been done wrong. I think people are are thinking about it the wrong way. We shouldn't even call it work life balance because balance implies that you're dealing with these opposing forces. And the way things are now, our work and our life is so intertwined, we got to think about it as harmony, work-life harmony. And I think other people have said that type of thing, but it's so true. When you think of harmony and how sounds and how things work together and make each other better, that's kind of how we have to think about it. And your day job and your night job can like sync together. You know, we've never had this opportunity like we do now to go for a run in the middle of the day, then do a meeting late at night. Now there is no nine to five, right? Like, and some people I think have looked at that and thought, Ooh, this is bad, but it's not for everybody. But I think this, this idea of how you make all the things that make up you, which is your work and your life and your family and your passions, um, how they all harmonize and work together. I think that's very, very important. So that's a big lesson that I think is the only way I'm able to do what I do now is to think about life as work life, and how they work in harmony. That's that's a great advice and a great and a way to finish the podcast. Uh, thanks for coming, man. Uh, that was great. Thanks for sharing everything that you've shared. Uh, please install Podbeat, uh, a great app. Uh, yeah, and uh, excited to stay in touch, man. And thanks for coming. Yeah. Let's do that. Thank you for having me, Danny. Good okay. luck. I look forward to hearing this.